The problem uh, I would like to submit here is that the discussion has been unfolded in a totalizing position in the way that the rest of local literatures, including their particularities in theory and tradition, have been burst into fragments. This kind of development of the world literature discourse must not have been its proper and original purpose, but now it faces the stage in which it needs to, it needs to some extent to be re-examined by reconsidering the positions of the local literatures. I know that our current panel was organized by the ACLA's serious and urgent requirement of its own self-repositioning in correspondence to these recent situations. I'd like to respond to the ACLA's just requirement in the ways of re-examining both aspects of a theory and position in relation to the comparative literature consciousness and practice that Korean comparatists may and need to have. I'd like to suggest what needs to be more emphasized in the West-centered or US-leading world literature or comparative literature rather than criticizing it directly. Further, I'd like to submit my own ideas rather than reporting the academic and educational activities the Korean comparatives have in reality been accumulating, which is even impossible due to their variety. In this way, I believe we can approach more effectively the multi-layered strata of the comparative literature around the world that we are discussing today. I'm going to discuss the aspect of a theory by highlighting the concepts of openness and universalization. I wish my talk covers the major stream of comparative literature perspective in Korea, facing the world literature as a tide to overcome. A theoretical platform that I would like to suggest for comparative literature in Korea or outside the US is wholly based on the concept of openness which provides a way of controlling the contingence of our knowledge and the world. I define openness as the process of an original organization of disorder, of oscillation between system and disorder, and of a play of presence and absence. Openness is a process or a field of individual local and decentered interpretation of the world and text and an unending interaction between text and reality which incessantly produces alternative or counter interpretations. It is an anti-essentialist concept for while essentialism operates unilaterally and thus protects itself against the possibility of change Anti-essentialism does not postulate necessary identities and their relationships. The theory of openness allows for a text which produces no essential meaning with which everyone ought to agree. This implies the escape from dogmatic structures of a thought and builds up the individual's place in the margins of those structures. My new theoretical context which is open, porous, and glocal, moves away from the system of binary oppositions to a comparative inquiry that concerns dynamic interactions among many heterogeneous points in such a way that they maintain their individualities. Interpretation is directly linked to practicing our ethical and political responsibility rather than merely excavating the internal coherence of the text or following the pre-established consensus. What matters here is that this kind of interpretive act is also linked to re-examining the universal universality of literary values, which needs to be highlighted with respect to the questions of what literature is and what it can do. Now we are faced with the consciousness of comparative literature. I believe that the theory of openness 
the theory of openness can best operate in comparative study only if it relates itself to the way in which a subject may be bound to the context surrounding it. Comparative literature is not confined to merely comparing two or more texts, but extends to measuring up our open attitude in facing our world and history. As a comparatist, I want my work to be a useful example to show how openness operates in our acts of interpretation, and further, how much a literal text is said to hold a true universal value, which differs from any kind of homogeneous universalism like uh, uni European universalism, to borrow from Immanuel Wallerstein. If, by my close reading of some text, I want to expose Korean literature in such a way as to attract more attention to the field of world literature, it is because I need to foreground the problem of what kind of relationship they can form with each other and what kind of new horizon of literariness they can construct in the future. It may be true that if I focus on evaluating Korean literature, it is inevitably possible only from the position of an other, that of Western literature, for instance. That is, I am compelled to be the subject and at the same time, the other. Indeed, this is the possible and useful strategy that a comparatist, if she or he does her or his job well, needs to adopt and maintain. The task of a comparatist is none other than enduring the boundlessness, the oscillation among plural positions that the work of comparing a variety of literary texts requires. I'd be pleased if my work could contribute to leading our comparative approach toward a more open horizon for our intellectual and ethical thought on literature. I emphasize that comparative literature is no longer a pure discipline, but a complex one in which we should be able to operate with a more inclusive mode of thought. This work, in fact, leads me to revive the concept and role of openness in our attempts to understand what literature is and can be. Although it is I myself who tries to expand the effect of the comparative approach, I need someone who would encourage me to maintain such endless and constant work to reevaluate literary texts ranging from the classics to the postmodern era. Likewise, I hope that Korean literature will be taken as an object to be re-examined in world literature in a more democratic way. If in this process, European literature could possibly become an object to be re-examined as well, that would also be a desirable outcome. In any case, I'd like to emphasize that our interpretation of literary text should be involved in a structure intermingled with world literature only insofar as the geography of world literature becomes a more open and just platform for exploring all local literatures. Thus, I would say that in order to understand and evaluate a text more properly, we always need more bridges to link it to diverse horizons, which I believe can be provided by our more open attitude and methodology. As a comparatist, I aim to shed new light on Korean literary texts and the relevant discourses in relation to three key concepts, universalism, the other, and literature. The capacity for self-negation is one of the essential conditions of literary universality. In other words, we should be able to define and control universality in that way. Without the ability of self-negation, a text allows for the creation of external borders, and at this very moment, universality disappears. True universality does not omit the particulars or localities, but goes beyond them by including them. 
the process in which a text includes the negations that occur inside and outside it is itself the essential content and condition for building the concept of universality in literature. When universality excludes the particular or the local, surpassing them in the process, it makes them converge in its center so as to be condensed within its boundary. This, this kind of universality is, in fact, nothing other than the particular or the local. The universal is constituted precisely by the process in which the particular escapes from its specific context while remaining nonetheless intact. In this sense, we can say that the particular and the local never oppose true universality. A text that excludes the particular cannot be said to be truly universal. If it does not include the universal, it is bound to appear universal only in its own peculiar context, precluding its reconstitution of the particular in all contexts. On this plane, the communicative relationship between the particular and the universal, between the plural particulars, becomes stagnant, and instead only the, only the oppositions between them prevail. Conversely, true universality, insofar as it is constituted in such a way as to recognize and maintain the particular and the local without succumbing to them, use the particular in the process of spreading the universal to new localities. In this way, the particular and the local contribute to constructing truly universal universality. Now, we can say that the particular exists by opposing the particular universality and at the same time by identifying, identifying itself. The particular maintains itself by dehomogenizing itself. In this, in this process, we can imagine the meaning of remaining as the particular and the true universality that overcomes all kinds of binary oppositions. Therefore, we need to pay more special attention to the practical mode of operation of the terms universalization or universalizability rather than universality. Universalism is the political, economic, and cultural issue that we are now facing. In our inevitably flawed globalization, universalism can be considered as a concept that may lead globalization to take on a more positive aspect. However, it should be emphasized that the concept of universalism in reality operates with a negative effect, so-called European universalism. Is only one example. By pursuing such universal values as justice, human rights, and civilization on a Eurocentric basis, it makes them particular instead. In reality, since the Renaissance in the 15th century, universalism has served as the motivating force for establishing the modern Western world. In relation to literature, Universalism has been reproduced by inventing and maintaining the value of the canon, also called the classics. However, such a process of reproduction, by making universalism particular instead, has betrayed the original conception and spirit of universalism and canonicity. Particularly in literature, universality can be conceptualized as a post-factum concept. It is not prescribed as a fixed norm, but only constructed in the literary process. Here, the literary process indicates circulation of the literary text in which the author sends out his or her recognition and expression of a history, society, and his or her own inner self, and the reader receives, responds, and criticizes. Indeed, Literary texts bear the origin of a universality that can be established only by negating and escaping from itself. Universality, in the whole literary process, alters as it is intermingled with the particular context. That is to say that universality maintains itself by altering. Universality is something that survives 
by being questioned in diverse contexts, enduring the chopping board of incessant re-examination. Therefore, we should say that the universality of literature is constituted in our acts of interpretation of the text. If the interpretation of a text is poor, its degree of universalizability is decreased, while if it is rich, it is increased. How much a text has a so how much a text has universal value depends on how much it opens itself to the interpretive acts that deconstruct and reconstruct it. It follows that we can only measure up the universality of a text rather than decide it, and further, the measuring varies according to the context. Now, the march of globalization has been unstoppable and irreversible, uprooting the local, which forces us to reconsider the problem of universality more seriously. The universal is the concept of evaluation. With this in mind, the term world in world literature needs to be understood in the sense of evaluating literature in diverse aspects instead of indicating the privileged role of representing peripheral literary texts, and thereby world literature can play the new role of measuring up the differences and commonalities of literatures instead of ruling over them as a standard. Therefore, we do not need to consider whether a theory becomes world literature or not, but to take the concept of world literature as a platform to help us reconsider universal literary value. We also need to recall that literature is a historical product bound to particular contexts and at the same time a universal construct beyond them. In relation to this, I would like to emphasize that Korean literature is still and from now on open to the broad horizon of reinterpretation and re-evaluation. The consciousness, comparative of, the consciousness of comparative literature, I believe, provides us with a theory, methodology, and attitude to maintain that openness so as to establish a dialogical relationship with world literature. In all, in order to recover the authenticity of universality, we need to develop a discourse through which we can revive the look we can revive the location of the other and operate in the role of the other and thereby suggest an example of criticism of it. This is because true universality has to possess the power to span all kinds of others and to make them communicate with each other. And for this, making the others participate in this process is necessary. Along with the transversal communication of the others, the process of negating and surpassing itself and simultaneously maintaining itself is the condition of true universality. I had planned to give some suggestions for collaborative relationships based on practical exchanges and conversations, but now I think I have done, I have already done it by uh, discussing the theoretical and positional examinations. Therefore, I am now suggesting to discuss altogether the possible ways for the collaborative relationships, not only between the US comparatists and Korean comparatists, but also among all the comparatists who are conscious of their identity as true comparatists. Thank you very much. Well, thank you um, so much to Professor Park San Jin. Um, my apologies for the uh, for the quality of the audio. It was a uh, pre-recorded uh, video, and uh, that we can only do so much uh, with the volume. Um, you know, he was addressing basically the a kind of demand on comparative literature to 
decentralize and world literature to decentralize and to rethink the concept of universality. Um, and I'd like to turn the podium to Professor Waiya Hassan, who's the co-organizer of the seminar, and he will introduce the next speaker. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is uh, Professor Ichita Chanda, who is Professor of Comparative Literature at the School of Literary Studies um, at the English and Foreign Languages University in Hyderabad, India. Uh, she has a teaching experience of 27 years at institutions, major uh, universities in India, like uh, Jadavpur University, Calcutta, and uh, currently, of course, English and Foreign Languages University. Uh, she has worked in theory uh, in the theory of literature and comparative approaches to Indian language literatures and served as ICCR Chair Professor of Indian Culture at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. Uh, in 2013-2014. So uh, she will uh, speak today her, um, on comparative practice, plurality, and the ethics of difference. Thank you very much, Wei uh, Lin Shumi. Uh, for the opportunity to participate in this panel. In these times of physical distancing, I cannot but remember the hospitality and the bonhomie of the preparatory conference to the previous decennial State of the Discipline report at Penn State in 2013, followed up by uh, the ACLA in New York in 2014, where uh, two bona fide participants, one of them being me, sneaked into the building without our identity badges under the wonderful unwavering regal wing of Barbara Harlow. Barbara Harlow was, as you all know, the writer of resistance literature, where she brought into circulation many wonders of the world that we did not know then, which resonated with what we knew and spoke to our hearts. I think it foregrounded what Guillen who was the subject of a paper at the 2013 Preparatory Explore Conference at Penn State, would have described as a supranational assemblage, a conceptual frame for reading, which did not limit us to the known categories of nation or modernity or even post-colonialism. I remember Barbara with gratitude and love for her unquenchable warmth and staunch support of outlaws and resistance. I invoke her book, despite my deep disagreement with many of the assumptions that underlie the construction of resistance, because I have learned to realize its value in bringing to bear historical, geopolitical, or sociological categories of understanding to literature as an experience of life. The ethical impulse in comparative literature, I would suggest, emerges from this experiential view. And I propose we consider the experiential as contexted in the geopolitical, thus understanding what Shumi referred to as the relationally interconnected world, transcending the binary approach as Florence advocated yesterday. I submit that the basic premise of understanding and learning to engage with difference is built upon a willingness to experience being dynamically in between the willingness to open oneself to the precarious possibilities brought into view by the other. And as such, this is not applicable exclusively to South Asian contexts or to India alone. The project of understanding and engaging with difference, I submit, is necessarily decentered, indeed, actively decentering. Often the nature of our discipline fits ill with the requirements of disciplinarity and institutionality, raising questions like how do we, or do we at all, relate the epistemology, that is what is comparative literature, and method, that is how do we do it, to the lives of texts, readers, and comparatists in no particular order. However, the ethical nature of our practice arising from relationality implies that if we fail to do so, our efforts at understanding difference stop short of criticism and fight shy of engagement, or rather remain limited by grand designs and borrowed paradigms. The very willingness of the, of the American Comparative Literature Association to widen the focus 
without prescribing an overarching category like world literature or multiculturalism, for example, to approach alterity without prefixing a method or objectifying it commands appreciation. As a student of comparative literature located away from the imagined center and so-called mainstream, and a sometimes visitor thanks to the generous tolerance of friends, I see the incongruities of both theoretical concepts and the practices originating in these imagined centers, which have led to such regular pronouncements of death, crisis, and transmogrification into translation studies, and sometimes, thankfully, as in Professor Basnet's presentation yesterday, rebirth. Perhaps I'm calling geopolitics by another name when I say that situationality, which is at the core of understanding alterity, would always interrogate these overarching categories, emphasizing further and rather more vigorously than we are used to doing, that plurality and relationality, difference and engagement are complementary aspects of existence. They perhaps become obvious when we grapple with the realities of living in a plural society and forge a path to the survival of the very idea of a humane world, which comparative literature, perhaps only comparative literature, can meet. In the discourses of the mainstream stroke margin, center stroke periphery, counter post developing developed, terms of the argument have been set around the institutionalized idea of a monocultural nation or a monolithic society that is assumed as pure, deviations are taken as hybrid. That, like all the rest of these categories, is geopolitically and philosophically located. But the reality of South Asia as a geopolitical category is defined in reality by Bangladesh, Pakistan, Nepal, Bhutan, further east or west, the subcontinent plus Sri Lanka, which share common languages and cultures and religions across geopolitical boundaries, living in relation to others, sharing a larger common history and geography, as well as histories of more ephemeral, recent or immediate interactions. Thus, it must be noted that contact is, is not necessarily always or only between two geopolitically divided nation states. As in the case of India, a single nation has a number of official languages and literatures written in them, which have a shared history, shared sources, and common inherited texts, as Shishir Kumar Das puts it. The Indian constitution, as per the eighth schedule, pertaining to the recognition of languages spoken in India recognizes 23 official languages, official meaning, in which states will foster and support state-run educational institutions. The government of the states can also be carried on in these official languages. Almost all of these languages have literatures dating to more than half a dozen centuries ago. Almost all of them are influenced by encounters with Islamic cultures in the plural and various European cultures and the nationalist movement against the colonizer. The comparative method is the only way to study Indian language literatures due to this linguistic and cultural plurality, which is described by Lachman Kukchandani as having these characteristics. A, the fuzziness of language boundaries, fluidity in language identity, identity claims versus language communications, and complementarity of intra-group and intergroup communications. This phenomenon is identified as a case of organic pluralism in contrast with the structural pluralism that prevails in many multilingual countries of Europe. Language plurality implies that neither sociolinguistic nor sociocultural boundaries are clearly marked. Individuals in a plural society belong to different identity groups clustered around cultural, linguistic, and social traits, such as nationality, religion, caste, language, or dialect, and share only a core of experience crisscrossing in more than one manner, 
hardly co-terminating within the same boundary. Each of these differences may be important in that it would operate to distinguish one group from another in one of its traits, but not all. Thus, Amyadev characterizes Indian literature not as an object, but as an interliterary condition, for which, according to Shishu Kumar Das, an integrated approach to literary history is required. Scol scholars like Swapan Mazumdar have pointed out the flaws of multiculturalism or cosmopolitanism as interpretive frames, arguing that in a study of Indian language literatures, the emphasis should be upon the pan-chronic relations between different language literary systems. These interrelations, according to Amyadev, make Indian literature an interliterary condition. In the words of Guru Bhagat Singh, this should be addressed as, and I quote, a differential multilogue, which given the plural nature of India as an entity, seems indeed to be an adequate access to Indian language literatures. Prompted by the reality of my location, I'm impelled to rethink the categories by which our discipline is governed and re-emphasize our commitment to engaging with difference as the foundational impulse of the discipline, which makes it the unsung but indispensable protagonist in the humanities. I do not think that adding a plural to the noun or geopolitical markers like names of nations or names of identities, marginalized or otherwise, will address and solve the problem, as it could do, for example, for an ideology-driven critical apparatus, which comparative literature is not. Comparative literature transcends that because historically it has questioned a monochrome universe by revelling in the infinite variety of located human experience as it is founded on difference. Comparative literature attempts to understand and engage with plurality in a plural world. What categories we use to think, extend into, and shape our thought, its relevance in the circumstances, is in questioning the fixation of binaries as much as following the dominant arrangement of the field. The dynamics of my location as a teacher of comparative literature in a plural society with constant intercultural contact between languages and cultures, practices and beliefs, forces me to rethink the idea we have of language and cultural contact and the categories of understanding we use to study them. The colonizing world created a set of myths and conventions that structured their relations with the colonizers and left a stratified society where there may have been none and introduced stratification along various axes where there already existed hierarchies. This is just one example of violent cultural contact which comes with its own subtle and complex ways of conceptualizing alterity and engaging with difference. Colleagues on this panel have already spoken of the various forms of this violence upon both literary and everyday experience in the present and the globalized neo-colonial world. A plural society remains plural because it evolves mechanisms for interactions between ways of living, thinking, and feeling, worldviews infinite in number. But the violent cultural contact of colonization and neo-colonization are actually also ways of encountering difference, literally decimating it, assimilating it, erasing it, organizing it, over-determining it, fixing it by adding value to it, according to the categories and standards and even critical lengths of the dominant culture. It is ultimately an attempt to impose a single culture and destroy plurality. Now, plurality and difference and engagement with, with alterity are common to any comparative literature project. They are ways of thinking inherent in comparative literature as a concept. They are concretely realized in actual lives of actual people in and outside literature. However, as my colleagues have pointed out, any study of difference seems to work on a set of assumed binaries or with a generalizing theory, for we seem to be determined to neatly categorize everything rather than focus on the dynamic relations between people, languages, and cultures. 
Earlier positions ranged from remedies for everything, saluting the existence of a many cultural but a single world in the idea of world literature. However, from listening to Professor Theo de Heyen yesterday, I do agree that the preponderance of English has limited the mainstream to a rather narrow window, especially in the academic neo-colonies across the world. So proposals for changed nomenclature and new categories of engagement, like Guillen and supranationalism, or Cesare Dominguez is reimagining re of emergent as field rather than as temporal or spatial or identity category, have not reached the so-called periphery as much as the narrow mainstream has served to limit our horizons. However, the so-called mainstream has indeed begun to reimagine itself in relation to its assumed and institutionalized others. Can the same be said of the others themselves? The very idea of Indian literature as a plural entity, as proposed by Amir Dev, Shishir Kumar Das, and Guru Bhagat Singh, have not gained currency in comparative literature departments in India. One reason is the close relationship with English literature as a discipline in neo-colonized academia. The ideal situation for a comparative literature department would be in conjunction with Indian language literature departments, ideally in a literary studies format. There are such experiments, but now they are dedicated to doing post-colonialism in Uriya literature or feminist readings of Dogri literature. Uriya and Dogri are two of the 23 official languages of India. The institutional relationship between comparative literature and Indian language literatures, as well as foreign language literatures, can be worked out if and when the need to place our students in teaching and academics is not li limited to seeking equivalence with English and includes competence in Indian languages. The medium of instruction is also an issue. English here serves the purpose only because of the diversity that is the 23 official Indian languages. Critical systems and poetics are indeed shared across languages and returning to the question asked yesterday, I would like to place my answer in the context of what I have said regarding the position of comparative literature as an academic discipline in India. As far as we have been able to, as I said, the poetics systems of Sanskrit, Tamil, and the Arabic and Persian traditions are taught as part of the master's program and are required for qualifying the national examination to teach and do research in comparative literature. But that is all. For us to reimagine our practice, we must realize that the master's tools will only lead to misunderstanding the non-master's many existences. We are still enamored of two decades old post-colonial, post-modern cultural studies formations and the more recent media and new media and communication formations to see the wood for the trees. However, we need not lay the responsibility at the door of fate, but also examine our own proclivities. So we need to shake off the post-colonial and the colonial, as well as the ancient Hindology hangover. As in the gene, it is in the genes of comparative literature to unconceal the psychophilosophical grounds of India as a plural entity and pluralism as a doctrine for a plural society. But this is a dangerous wish for the future, for it sets the discipline at odds with any aggressively followed ideology of a powerful and homogenizing state. However, the ideology of homogenization is questioned by the very discourse used to erase plurality, that is, Hindology. For example, the belief in pluralism reached by Buddhist and Jain philosophies interrogate the overarching hegemony of social stratification, legitimized by religious sanction, proposing varieties of pluralism to counter the effects of social and economic stratification. Anekantvad, for example, is a core belief of Jainism, the religion professed, professed by Mahavir in the fourth century before the Christian era rejecting the binary conception of the universe. Anekantwad states that truth is conditioned 
and perspective. A variety of perspectives, a plenitude of views, thus illuminate the many splendor, plural, located nature of truth. Those advocating so-called ancient Hindological views and values, however, would find it hard to follow these precepts, given the agenda of a mono-religious, mono-cultural state. Thus it is that the new education policy practices a slate of hand, which may be strategically used. It is on the surface most conducive to comparative literature. Insisting on humanities and arts as part of the overall education of an individual, regardless of which stream of knowledge she is enrolled in. The importance of languages, the crucial function of translation, the insurmountable value of classics and the classical, which includes the list of all Indian languages without once mentioning Urdu, which is a language recognized by the Indian constitution. This stops us short, for it brings us finally to the ethics of relation. By ethics, I only wish to indicate what is proper to time and place, which guides our relations with the world. We have discovered that Indianness, like being in the world, is not a given essence, but a way of living daily with diverse beliefs, languages, and worldviews in a plural society. Engagement and relation between difference is a daily event. It is the stuff of our existence. The future of comparative literature in India and the world over is crucial to the maintenance of a world of diversity and equality of difference. And how we relate to the other is therefore an ethical question and an existential one, posed on behalf of us all by comparative literature, which we seek to answer with our practices and beliefs. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Ishita, for that uh, in incredibly uh, uh, well-considered well, uh, uh, remarks uh, that puts pressure on both the very narrow mainstream that American uh, scholars uh, represent uh, and, and those who uh, do really love to pronounce, uh, and also the pressures that you put on um, the practice of uh, interlingual, interliterary uh, studies um, in India. Um, our next speaker is Professor Nazri Barawi, who uh, specializes in the comparative study of texts, theories, and traditions of Indian Ocean cultures between the Malay archipelago and the Middle East. He's a senior lecturer at the Singapore University of Technology and Design and an editor at large at Wasaf Wasafiri Magazine. He's working on two co-edited volumes at the moment on Southeast Asia. Uh, the first investigates the region's literal zones and the other explores his engagement with theory. And today his presentation is entitled A Bandung Conference Revival in Southeast Asia? Question mark. Thank you. Nazri. May help. I will begin by thanking Shumei and also uh, Wail Hassan for putting together this excellent three-day panel. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be speaking uh, alongside scholars uh, whose works have inspired me. And I'm especially elated that I get to touch on Southeast Asia, a geographical area that is uh, understudied in the field of comparative literature. By Southeast Asia, I'm referring to a region that can be geographically subdivided into first mainland Southeast Asia, comprising Myanmar, Thailand, Laos, and Cambodia, and second maritime Southeast Asia, made up of the states of Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, Brunei, and the Philippines. We might also consider the idea of greater Southeast Asia by factoring in nations like Taiwan, East Timor, Sri Lanka, as well as locations uh, like the southern states of Tamil Nadu and the Hadramaut region of Yemen, all of which has strong diasporic, diasporic ties to the region of Southeast Asia. As a discipline, very few universities in Southeast Asia have comparative literature departments. Exceptions to these are the University of Diliman, Philippines, 
and the Chulalongkorn University in Bangkok, Thailand. Even Singapore, which has two universities that appear in most global rankings in the top 15 uh, positions, has no comparative literature department. And I will return to these points later. While I'm making the point that there is a dearth of comparative literature in Southeast Asia, it can also be said that Southeast Asia is lacking in comparative literature. This latter observation extends to the place of Southeast Asia in the World Republic of Letters and Films. As a region, Southeast Asia is often conceptualized as an afterthought in creative efforts that gesture to global cultures. And indications of its tangentiality can be gleaned from a series of film and television productions that emerged out of the United States at the tail end of the 2010s. The film Crazy Rich Asians in 2018, directed by John Chu, based on the book by Kevin Kwan, was hailed as a triumph for Asian American representation. But at the same time, it erroneously depicted Singapore as uber rich and ultra Chinese. Similarly, uh, Spike Lee's movie, The Five Bloods in 2020, was praised for presenting a nuanced view of the plights of Vietnam War veterans of African American ethnicity at the cost of simplistically reducing its Vietnamese characters to sidekicks or extras, according to the Pulitzer Prize winning author Viet Thanh Nguyen in an interview. More recently, the 2021 Disney animated film, Raya and the Last Dragon, attempts to move away from the American centricity of the aforementioned films. Yet while the film is seemingly populated by Southeast Asian characters, it has also drawn flag for the hiring of East Asian actors to voice them and for presenting the region as a fantastical place. These examples give us an indication of the geopolitics of comparison concerning Southeast Asia. The first point that I want to raise is that the linguistic, religious, and political diversity of the region is flattened into a pastiche of sorts, as demonstrated through the Disney film, Raya and the Last Dragon. In contrast, Disney has not reduced the entire region of Europe into a pastiche. Second, in relation to Shumei's comment on US centrism, the region has become a means to center the American story, even if that narrative is empowering to certain ethnic minority groups in the States. The case of the Five Bloods, like I mentioned earlier, has the effect of relegating Southeast Asia as setting and Southeast Asians as extras. And thirdly, there is a sense that the region is Sino-dominant, as in the case of crazy rich Asians. In Chinese majority Singapore, the public has begun to draw pa parallels between the operations of Chinese privilege in relation to white privilege in America. But it is all, not all doom and gloom, fortunately. Increasingly, there are signs in cultural scholarship of an alignment that I would want to call the Bandung Conference decoloniality. The Bandung Conference of 1955 was a political event organized by newly independent states in Asia, Africa, and the Middle East to express economic and political solidarity between them with the view of opposing colonialism and neo-colonialism. Held in Bandung, Indonesia, with the then Indonesian president Sukarno fashioning himself as the leader of this group, the, the heads of the 21 nations signed a 10-point declaration towards the uh, uh, above-mentioned ideals. The conference later led to the formation of the non-aligned movement in 1961, but given their composition, the conference was officially also known as the Afro-Asia Conference. I reckon that many here are familiar with the idea of decoloniality, but so that we're on the same page, I would like to clarify what I mean by it. I'm referring to the theoretical frame popularized by Walter Mignolo in works like The Darker Side of Western Modernity. I have chosen this overarching framework over post-colonialism to describe this newfangled alignment precisely because decoloniality emphasizes the pursuit of alternative knowledges and perspectives in the non-West. Meanwhile, post-coloniality 
has been centered on deconstructing existing knowledges resulting from British, Dutch, French, and Spanish colonialism and hegemony. In short, decoloniality deals with uh, issues of epistemology. One aspect of the Bandung decoloniality relates to the question that I posed yesterday in, in the panel on the application of theory and lenses from the Western hemisphere to interpret texts and films from the non-West. I'm not the first in the field to talk about this. It has already been raised by Ravati Krishnaswamy in 2010, when she calls on comparative lit scholars to do the hard work of expanding the field of literary theory to include, to include uh, uh, and I quote her, non-Western poetics, criticisms and commentaries in a bit to determine which aesthetic concepts are universal and which are limited to certain cultural traditions. Responding to Krishna Swami, Khen Ba Isak in a 2019 article argues for an epistemic shift with regards to how we read literary texts to guard against what she calls intellectual captivity, referring to the normative practice by world literature scholars to privilege Western philosophical tradition when interpreting texts from all cultures. I believe Han has co-organized a panel on epistemic justice in this annual conference dealing with this very topic. In Southeast Asia, the decolonial pursuits of contextual and indigenous theory, thoughts and tradition is taking place though they are not led by literary scholars. A notable work here is one by National University of Singapore, Said Farid Alatas and Benita Sinas uh, in, a, in their book called Sociological Theory Beyond the Canon, published in 2019, which expands the can canon of sociological theory to include the writings of figures like Jose Rizal of the Philippines and Pandita Ramabai Saraswati of India, alongside uh, figures like Karl Marx and the kind. Other representations of this includes the articulation of Nusantara Islam as a means of distancing the practice of Islam in, in Muslim Southeast Asia from the ones in the Middle East. The move to unveil local theory or knowledges is the first feature of the Bandung decoloniality that I would like to highlight. A second feature of the Bandung decoloniality has to do with the spirit of Afro-Asia solidarity demonstrated in the conference itself. And this is especially pertinent in the increased scholarly attention on cultural cosmopolises, such as the Sinophone, of which Shu Mei, she is a pioneer, and Ike Tan is also uh, working in this area. And more recently, the Arabic, uh, the Arabic cosmopolis of South and Southeast Asia theorized by Ronit Ritchie. Here, Indian Ocean Studies is the most recent cultural cosmopolis that Southeast Asian scholars have begun to explore it warrants mentioning that there is an organized panel also in this ACLA conference on Indian Ocean imaginaries, which speaks to this newfangled pursuit. It is a framework that informs my own personal work too. Yet, existing Afro-Asia scholarship in Southeast Asia have been done by historians such as Eng Seng Ho with Graves of Tarim, Sumit Mandal with Becoming Arab, and Nur Fazila Yahya with Fluid Jurisdictions. However, these works, uh, and we might also include Ronit Ritchie's Islam Translated here, are focused on drawing out specific linkages and ties. That is, they are not strictly comparative in terms of studying parallels between cultures, even if these cultures have no explicit connection. And this is something that I hope to do in my own research, uh, that to look at parallels rather than connections and linkages and something that I've also noticed in the work of my fellow literary scholar of Southeast Asia, Wei Xin Gui, uh, who's also uh, moving into these, I, um, the, the, the Indian Ocean Cultural Studies. And a final feature that I would like to outline of Bandung the coloniality is the one is one that I believe is led by literary and cultural studies scholars themselves. And this has to do with an increased attention to the landscapes of Southeast Asia as an object of study, but also as metaphor. Here, work has been done by the likes of my ACLA panel's co-organizer, Joanne Liao, on coastal ruins and land reclamation that connects Singapore to Australia and Cambodia, for instance. Cultural studies scholar Nadine Chan of Claremont Graduates University 
is working on a monograph investigating complexity theory in visual and data-driven representations of the Anthropocene. These qualify as works of environmental literature, uh, environmental humanities or eco-criticism. Landscapes are also gaining attention in Southeast Asian translation studies. I am currently working with a group of translation studies scholars from Southeast Asia on an edited volume about the translation landscape of the region stemming from a conference in Bangkok funded by the International Association for Translation and Intercultural Studies. And I want to end now and summarize. I have earlier raised the point that there is a dearth of comparative literature departments in Southeast Asian universities. I have also outlined that there is a lack of Southeast Asia in the discipline of comparative literature as a global practice. However, outside the normative definitions of comparative literature as a field, it is encouraging to note that comparative cultural work is not absent in different disciplines about Southeast Asia, including literary and cultural studies that attempts to channel the Afro-Asia spirit of the Bandung Conference of 1955. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Nazri, for this uh, you know, uh, wonderful um, uh, presentation on this state of comparative literature in Southeast uh, Asia, very informative uh, indeed. Um, our next uh, speaker is Ayman Dusuki, uh, Associate Professor of Modern Arabic and Comparative Literature and founding chair of the new program in comparative literature at the Doha Institute for Graduate Studies. Uh, Dusuki uh, was the founding chair also of the Center for Cultural and Literary, Cultural, Literary and Postcolonial Studies at the School of Oriental and African uh, Studies at London University and co-founder of the pioneering degree English at uh, SOAS uh, at the University at, at the same uh, school at University of London. He studied English and comparative literature at the American University in Cairo and comparative literature at the University of Texas uh, at Austin. And he has taught at uh, Texas at Austin as well as at Johns Hopkins, um, uh, Harvard, uh, London University, of course, and now at the Doha Institute. Uh, for graduate studies. His presentation is entitled Unreconstructive Disciplinarity, Positioning Comparativism in the World. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, Well, And uh, I wish to begin by thanking you again and thanking Shumi for uh, bringing us together and for uh, basically planning um, quite a crucial and uh, highly, uh, I would say, significantly timed uh, panel. And also, I wish to thank uh, all our Brazilian colleagues to whom we referred in the prehistory of the panel. Uh, I have, I, I wish to begin by uh, apologizing or uh, rather noting that I have opted not to uh, read my, uh, from my paper <clears throat> in the sense of uh, offering um, uh, a theoretical position or uh, a series of theoretically uh, oriented explorations sealed in writing as such. Uh, I have outlined my position regarding comparative literature and uh, in relation to developments in world literature and um, untranslatability in, in a partly programmatic piece um, and uh, also with the idea that I wish to share more for our discussion and benefiting from the presence of all our colleagues here. Uh, I wish to share some aspects of uh, the challenges of uh, structuring a program uh, as a kind of intervention in itself or a premise on a theoretical intervention and uh, Particularly, I mean, I, I, I thank uh, Pak Sangji and Naz, uh, Nazri and Ipshita as well. They have given us an excellent, uh, highly crucially engaged um, uh, view of uh, uh, Korea, South Korea, uh, India and South Asia and Southeast Asia. And uh, what it means basically to uh, establish or uh, plan to introduce comparative literature as a discipline 
and uh, in other spheres, in this case, in the Arab world. Uh, I will begin uh, uh, briefly by a few remarks uh, on the question of disciplinarity uh, and how we can, uh, or uh, how I have decided to rethink it uh, once I've relocated to uh, the Arab world and to Doha, and then offer a few uh, ideas uh, or some of the background to the Arab scene and comparative literature uh, and comparative practices. And then uh, just very briefly uh, cite the conception on which the new program here in Doha was structured and why. Um, uh, to begin with, I, um, I was quite delighted uh, when Susan yesterday offered us the positive note again, that uh, of course, uh, comparative literature has always been a history in crisis. And in many ways, that's precisely how it has developed historically, critically, and theoretically. Uh, uh, however, because of that, uh, and because of the optimistic note, which I'll explain in a minute, and not just optimism in itself, which is good too, but uh, in the sense of insisting on the disciplinary thrust of comparative literature uh, uh, when, or in the face of, uh, for example, the possibility of reducing it to the question of method in world literature, which is a big issue now all of us are having to face, which I think uh, is still uh, being thought out or thought up in the sense that so far we have a kind of cartographic anxiety really replacing the endemic anxiety of comparativism uh, or anxiety of comparison, as was mentioned in one of the reports earlier, but I'll come back to that point. And also uh, seeking comparative literature as a discipline in the face of uh, post-colonial approaches and the question of so-called return of the literary or return to the literary in recent approaches to post-colonial, uh, in post-colonial theory, and which I think Abshita has, has uh, quite uh, brilliantly um, uh, exposed as such. Uh, in terms of what it means to begin from the diversity on the ground and the large histories and complex histories uh, beyond any dualities of colonial, uh, colonizer and colonized or <coughs> uh, disc discursive constructs of um, identity, language, nation, representation and history and so on. And uh, a third space is or space of boundaries or where we can draw the discipline or the disciplinary boundaries is also in the face of culture studies and the, uh, the approach of a socially coded textuality in cultural studies. Even when we have not so long ago begun, begun to speak of verbal culture studies, but I still believe that is different from the thought of the literary, which is still, I think, the defining uh, thrust of comparative literary thought. And finally, of course, the problems of translatability in translation studies, uh, and which I think are quite significant in, as a first uh, phase of thinking difference, uh, but not yet the thought of the literary uh, behind it. So in this sense, I, uh, it, it is quite important to uh, insist on disciplinarity, uh, especially when uh, uh, attempting to establish a new program in, in, in the Arab world, for example. Or I would presume now, having just listened to uh, what has, I mean, to the cases of South Korea, India, and Southeast Asia, uh, which we've discussed also when I was at SOAS. Um, and from there, I pick up also uh, something that Susan mentioned, which is taking risks, the necessity to take risks, to be daring. Uh, this has been, has of course been uh, uh, important in the recent practices, that is uh, opting to work on uh, difficult knots or discrepant practices and looking at them together comparatively. And this is exciting. And this is a way of expanding the remit 
of the discipline. Uh, and I still remember David Damarish's uh, uh, pet phrase when he visited uh, uh, in London about comparing the incomparable as such, but uh, which I think is quite exciting, but I still believe this comparative act has to be theoretically grounded. And the challenge, the risk, the excitement is how to ground it theoretically, which brings us to the question of uh, who owns the critical idiom as such, even when we're expanding the comparative remit or the scope or changing positionalities, looking or uh, working from a different positionality, we still have to contend with who owns the critical idiom as Emily <coughs> points out in, in her discussions of uh, untranslatability and neurochronology and so on. And just to mention one brief example from my experience at SOAS uh, and uh, in establishing the center and in seeking to, uh, to be vigilant about the boundaries of uh, the new disciplines at SOAS vis-a-vis uh, -vis area studies while drawing on the regional expertise precisely that exists in unparalleled concent concentration at SOAS. And, uh, but within that also, as she, as Susan hinted yesterday, and um, I hope she'll be happy to hear that as well, uh, in creating three independent tracks uh, research tracks in comparative literature, in post-colonial studies, and in culture studies. Uh, each designed to draw on regional expertise, but to offer a certain disciplinary training that was not had before at SOAS, uh, being, of course, as we know, a kind of stronghold of area studies. Um, so, and I've had, well, after redesign, or rather designing the new PhD programs, I've had to uh, design a new research training seminar. Uh, as we all know, uh, in the UK and European system, we don't have as much coursework for PhDs as we have in the US. Uh, but for the first time I have in the room, or I had in the room, a whole range of expertise. Well, I'm not talking about demographics as in the, on, on the North American scene, so I have, I would have Chinese, Korean, Japanese, Amharic, Thai, Finnish, Italian, French, English, of course, Latin, Greek, uh, and indeed at one point, uh, Middle Egyptian hieroglyphics as well. Um, uh, <clears throat> and uh, in seeking to uh, offer training in comparative literature uh, as a discipline, and students already will have come in with the language, with the expertise. Uh, the question is, what was the shared language in the room? How did we all engage? And uh, whether we would fall back uh, by default on uh, critical idioms in English or French or German, uh, and what that means, uh, particularly when it came to uh, questions of aesthetics or uh, the Sanskrit concept of rasa, for example, or Arabic tahil, and a whole range of key concepts and practices that unlock local traditions or other traditions. Uh, and um, uh, that was when I began to think that uh, uh, while surrounding debates were focused on the world and world literature, for example, and cartographies of the world, uh, we had yet to really rethink literature or the literary in these debates. And that it's only through rethinking the literary strongly, philologically in these different traditions that we can uh, uh, basically begin to enter the idiom as, uh, Gayatri Chakrabarti Spivak um, has pointed out. And, um, and also, uh, the, <clears throat> this, this was a question, I think, at the end of yesterday's session, which I thought was crucial. So uh, with this, quite quickly and uh, briefly, I know I'm uh, coming to the end uh, of my time, but um, uh, uh, on the Arab scene, uh, and while I'm sure we'll uh, 
confirmed that when he mentioned or cited Kelito saying Arabic is always read comparatively. Uh, this basically meant comparatively with Western literatures as such, with French or German or English uh, or Italian. And uh, ever since uh, the 1950s, when a pioneering study of comparative literature came out in Arabic, and we have since then about over, well, over 160 book titles with comparative literature in them. All of them prove Kelito's remark, basically. And none of them, uh, or this kind of activity amounted to any disciplinary formation. There are a few courses here and there in, in major language departments. We do have about four associations of Arab comparatists, but uh, no uh, institutional or disciplinary formation. Uh, and the question, of course, when I arrived here about five years ago uh, in Doha, uh, uh, what it means in this scene and in the presence of powerful national language departments, uh, and in the presence of, of all the crises we talk about uh, in America or in Europe, uh, what, it, what does it mean to establish a new program here? And that is when I decided, and it's a program, not a department, and it's, it's a program not surrounded by any language department. Uh, it's a new venture, the Doha Institute for Graduate Studies. I have access to philosophy, to anthropology, to linguistics and lexicology, but uh, we don't have any other language departments. In any case, uh, that is when I have opted to turn the thought of the literary uh, into the centralizing principle of the new structure and reactivating comparativism, comparativism as a logical priority of the discipline and uh, without having to reconstruct the history of crisis, of course. It doesn't make sense to reproduce this history uh, from my positionality here. And uh, to do so, I have uh, developed, and this was the result of uh, many talks and encounters with uh, Emily, with Emily Apter, and uh, also with David and with Well and uh, Osama Bulala and quite a few colleagues and Michael Allen and um, quite a few colleagues uh, who are in comparative literature, but also dealing with Arabic. And uh, of course, uh, Emily was more over the question of untranslatability and in part at the time also actually with Catherine Malibu and the question of plasticity and the singularity of the incident. So uh, untranslat untranslatability is redeployed uh, behind the structure of the program and I've designed a whole new course around it that complements also of course the core theory course in theories of comparative literature. And it's uh, redeployed in four dimensions, hermeneutically as thinking uh, from singularity, and uh, epistemologically as working against universal, the universalizing impulse of theory. Uh, and um, uh, critically, of course, thinking in more than one language and uh, philosophically as a kind of, in terms of critical humanism, as the promoting the idea of the literary as a humanist knowledge that allows us to re rework localities, multilingual localities and, uh, mul and multiple histories. The hallmark of this new training is close reading, which I still think is the basic uh, identifying uh, training in comparative literature, as well as a rigorous philological training working between Arabic and English. English itself is already approached untranslatably as such, meaning there are multiple, it's a translational language of theory. It's not just uh, as a global uh, English as such, or the hegemony of global English. Um, and also this uh, opening this up, uh, uh, I am able to work with all our students and the language languages they have. Uh, and that includes Tamazight, Kurdish, uh, Yoruba, uh, and meaning activating local languages, as Ifshid said, 
the Arab world is not just about Arabic, <laughs> which is very important. And it's not just a uh, homogenous, culturally and linguistically homogenous region. Uh, it's a vast territory of not just 22 countries, but also what happens to Arabic as we just heard Nazi as well in, throughout Asia. And we are here at the crossroads. And it's important to offer modalities for that. So Arabic is offered as a modality for what it means to think locally, multilingually, and to generate conceptual language from these practices, including oralities as well, which I've added to the structure of the program. I do not wish to continue. I'm sorry, I, I have gone beyond my time, but I'm hoping to can continue over our discussion. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Ayman, for your um, grounded, a very grounded uh, uh, presentation on, um, on all this wine ranging uh, issues in comparative literature. And uh, in some ways not replicating uh, the crisis of comparative literature as a disciplinary formation or as an institutional formation uh, in where uh, what you do and where you are. It's very interesting because um, as uh, Ishita was challenging, you know, the narrow mainstream that U.S. Uh, compared literature represents, uh, but U.S. also offers some examples of what not to do. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, we're open for uh, Q&A, and uh, I ask the attendees to please uh, type your questions to the uh, chat box. And uh, to the presenters and also the other seminar uh, presenters who are present, um, if you have any questions, please unmute yourselves. And, um, and um, because it's difficult for me to see everybody, we have uh, 40, currently 41 participants. Um, but let me begin by um, asking a question to uh, all the uh, panelists, uh, which, is, which is the question of to engage or not to engage with the so-called narrow mainstream. Uh, from uh, where you are, uh, you also have the option of not to engage. Um, and uh, because you can challenge uh, the mainstream by ignoring it you know, what I guess scholars have called sanctioned ignorance. Uh, it's not an ignorance uh, coming out of not knowing, but it's an ignorance uh, that comes out of um, the desire to, uh, to decentralize and really, uh, you know, kind of foreground the centrality of the geopolitical locations from which uh, you study and profess comparative literature. And so I'll be curious to know, uh, you know, all of us have very graciously engaged with the US uh, and, and at the same time, what do you think about the politics of non-engagement? Uh, whereas the center doesn't, shouldn't really have that option or luxury, uh, but um, do you uh, from your locations uh, or not? Uh, I think the center does, uh, you know, carries the ethical obligation of engagement and uh, relationality, because that's precisely how the center rules, as you know, many of you uh, have uh, have uh, uh, have said. So, um, would um, any of the uh, presenters like to respond to that? And then uh, we have some other questions that are coming up. Please just unmute yourselves. Well, I was waiting for Nazi and Ipshita if you wish to start. Otherwise, I'll go. I mean, otherwise, I'll go after. Well, I've, I'll, I'll just uh, offer a very brief answer to that. Um, the question is uh, it's not simply, uh, first of all, what it means to have as a point of departure, not power differential, not anxiety, not Eurocentrism, but to turn this into a hermeneutical occasion for working locally. 
because the realities on the ground are, as we've seen in the different cases here, uh, the local practices, the local approaches to literature are still quite uh, beholden to old literary historical models and periodicities and assumptions about genre and assumptions about what literature is, meaning even ignoring uh, it's already a practice that is part of the realities uh, locally in the, in the region, for example. And so for me, I'm using comparative literature as, as an excuse. Uh, first of all, it has developed multiple modes of thinking about literature. Uh, it's already implicit in the local practices and attitudes and ideologies, uh, which uh, ironically, historically have become quite essentialist, but without realizing uh, that uh, the language in which this essentialist or ideological approach is, uh, is, is couched is already uh, coming from somewhere else. So the idea is to implode and to open it up. Thank you. Uh, Ishta? Yeah, I, I've been, thank you very much for the question as well as for the answer. Actually not the question, the suggestion. I mean, I really wish, but the situation is such that, you know, when it is a discipline, when you're teaching something, like, I mean, you need to go into all of this. So it's not a question of not being able to, I mean, you know, you have to engage, but the way in which it is engaged in is crucial again. I mean, you don't just, it, it, it's not knowledge that you're disseminating, right? So it's, it's an engagement. In that sense, yes, I think, I mean, we, we cannot avoid engaging with the history. And also, I mean, if we are different, we are different from something. So we need to know what we are different from. So, I mean, I, but it, it, was, it was a lovely idea. It, it was really a lovely idea. I think it, it, it's something that can be taken on board theoretically. And I, I absolutely intend to do it. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah you know, there was a just very quickly. There was a uh, situation where I think I was having a conversation with some local feminists in Taiwan, and uh, I was talking to them about certain things that are happening uh, in U.S. academia having to do with Taiwan, and uh, and they said, "But Shu Mei, that's not important to us. Mm -hmm. What's important is what's going on here." This is what she, what they said to me, and I was really inspired. Uh, that they took that position, and and hence my question. I think Nazri wanted to say something. Yeah, I I, I notice increasingly with regards to scholars who work in with Southeast Asia that they are engaging with materials from Southeast Asia, and there is and a really strong interest to try to form a bond or an affinity between people in their immediate vicinity rather than uh, than than far away. And, but I think with regard to scholars themselves trying to interpret these uh, materials, then that's where the engagement with American, uh, you know, academia comes in because most of the, uh, you know, literary theory, like I've mentioned in my, uh, you know, presentation uh, is available because there is a dearth of critical vocabulary developed out of uh, Southeast Asia. And I think that the first challenge to this engagement, which I am, um, I think it's you know something that I would be pro uh, is is to develop a critical vocabulary of our own, and I think uh, that's uh, very important. And it's really hard work because you got to delve deep, and you there is very little basis sometimes to start from. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we have uh, we have uh, three people uh, in line, and the first person uh, asking questions is. Amar Naji, would you unmute yourself and limit your question to uh, perhaps about at most two minutes, just so that we have enough time for people to respond and ask all the other questions. Thank you. Thank you all for, um, and, and especially uh, uh, Shome and Wild for uh, putting this together. Really wonderful uh, um, presentations. Um, two things. Um, the first is for um, um, Ishita and the second is for Nazri. You both mentioned um, interesting things about um, the case of the plurality of Indian languages. I myself actually growing up in the Arab world, I was taught English morphology by um, a professor from India who taught us English morphology through Malayalam, the language of Kerala. And the British Council reject, I mean, re 
in a way responded saying that this is gibberish English because they could not. So, and I was wondering how do you approach, because you raised this in your point, in your discussion of the plurality of Indian languages and literatures, how do you approach the teaching of literature as a generic form of, you know, um, comparativity? And for Nazari, um, you mentioned the Hadrimi diaspora. I was so happy because um, in Yemen and also parts of the Arab world, um, the focus has been diaspora is moving from the, you know, east to the west. But there's a lot we can talk about. Indo-Arabic, Swahili Arabic, um, Java, Indone Indonesian Arabic um, writing that goes back before colonialism. So how do you approach, you know, the discussion, the teaching of languages, cultures, um, and also literature in relation to other disciplines like anthropology, diaspora, migration studies? Thank you both for all, for all your um, presentations. Nikita, you can go first. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, that, that uh, is a very important question. And uh, it's a project which has started, but which is unfinished. And I think it will remain unfinished because it's almost impossible. You see that, I mean, to give you an, uh, a complete answer, uh, I will have to just go back into the education system for a moment. But all of this is in the past because, like I said, a new education policy has just been implemented, which has a great emphasis on languages. I mean, specifically languages, Indian languages, as well as foreign languages. There has been, in fact, a three language formula across the country, which means that you study the language of the state and you study English and something which is called a third language. There's a lot of politics on this third language because that is probably not the language of your state, but at the same time, it is a language which is uh, comprehensible to a larger number of people than the language of your state. So, I mean, that is to put it absolutely neutrally. Most translations, I mean, the fact that there are 23 official languages, I only mentioned uh, that official means that it is a medium of instruction and a medium of state uh, transactions in each state, it is also, uh, these 23 languages are also uh, languages whose literatures are given prizes by the Central Academy of Letters. And whatever is given a prize is translated into as many other languages as possible. Now, as you can see, this is kind of just, if you think in terms of the sheer numbers, it's a wonderful project, which is going to be defeated by the number of things that you have to do. That is, you translate into 23 into 23 works every year, because every year, one work in one language gets a prize. That's 23 plus one, because there's also English. So, I mean, as you can understand, this is just a project. And like I said, it, it's not a very consistently implemented project, but it is there in our mind. And at various levels. Now there is going to be an impact of the new education policy because some languages, like I mentioned, uh, are going to be, uh, well, erased. Because if there is not this official machinery, the literature in the language will survive, but we will have no way of knowing because translation is a larger enterprise. So it depends on, you know, individual. I mean, there is a lot of work in translation which goes on at various levels. But the larger project is has been till date. I don't know how it will change with the impact of the national, with the new education policy. The larger project is at the national level in several different national organizations. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so um, I we're, yeah. we're, we're limited by time. We only have 12 minutes left. And so, uh, uh, Nazri, I'd like to give you a chance to respond to that question. And then we have uh, several other questions. So let's right. make the uh, answers short and questions short so that we can include everybody. Right. So I'll just try to give a really short and uh, crisp answer. And, and that is to say that, indeed, there is a, a, a kind of global Arabic uh, kind of influence in Southeast Asia. And the most clearest instance of that is in the script before the romanization of the Malay language, and that's called the Jawi script. And these are in ancient texts. And I think that 
uh, there has not been much study done about uh, this part of uh, literature, which is the pre-modern. And I think that certainly is a way to go uh, in, in the future. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll keep it to that and we can talk further if there, you know, I haven't addressed that. Thanks. And Marie Therese, you have a, a few questions. Would you like to uh, admit yourself and uh, um, okay. ask them? Well, uh, quickly, please. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, the question is for Ipshita and for uh, Ayman at the same time. Hi, both of you. Uh, now, it, it seems that Ipshita is very much in line with translatability and acceptance of plurality in the Indian context. Whereas Ayman seems to be, uh, to think what binds us is untranslatability. So can you both expand on this issue? This is the first question. And the second question is to you, Ayman. You seem to, be, yeah, I understand you speaking from Doha in, in an Arabic context, but uh, this uh, between quotes Arab world, you, you, you're all very fond of using uh, just loosely. Do you think there is translatability among Arab speaking nations? Okay, so I think you have to resolve that before resolving the world and translatability with the world, okay? So that's, that, these are my questions, thank you. Thank you. Actually, because of limited time, I'm gonna uh, collect all the questions and have the uh, three presenters give uh, kind of a, you know, answers at the end. So the next question is from Antoine, uh, Antoinette uh, Arogo. And I will read the uh, question here. Thank you for the educative presentations. My question is for Nazari. In the necessary project of decolonizing epistemology or of retrieving the epistemologies of the South, how can we avoid the pitfalls, pitfalls of nativism? How can indigeneity be conceptualized in conjunction with global flows? And, um, and another question from EK10. EK, do you want to uh, unmute yourself and speak or should I read? Um, I can do it real quick. Um, so uh, thank you to the panelists for a wonderful panel. Um, Nazri, um, thank you uh, for sharing your perspective on comparable, comparative literature in and on Southeast Asia. Uh, as you mentioned, there is a range of exciting work um, engaged by scholars such as Joanne Liao, Nadine Chan, uh, Wei Xinghui, and yourself uh, that fall in the um, that falls in the category uh, broader ca uh, field of comparative cultural studies. Uh, however, many of these scholars, except for yourself, are working outside the region and mostly in North America. Right. Um, so my question is about curriculum curriculum design and planning in tertiary level level education in places such as Singapore and Malaysia. Uh, these are places that you are somewhat, uh, you're much you're familiar with, right? Um, so do you see the lack of attempt to decolonize the curricula in universities in Singapore and Malaysia as an impediment to the presence and cultivation of comparative literature and studies uh, as um, not just a field, but also um, a methodology? Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, E.K. And the last question is from Azra uh, Gandeharian, and I will read. Granted that comparative literature is West-centric, but how do you explain comparative literature in anti-colonial countries that marginalize American and European literature slash theory? So the outcome will be rather local, not Western, but ideological. What can comparative literature do to solve this problem? Thank you. So um, perhaps Ayman can speak first, um, two, two, about two minutes per person. Thank you, Shumi. Um, I'll be very brief, uh, especially that I'm sorry, again, I went over time. But uh, just to begin with, uh, with uh, Marie Therese's uh, last question is precisely by unpacking Arab untranslatabilities and understanding that, that I am, well, the program is poised to try and offer or reach a modality for uh, rethinking really translatabilities. Uh, so in that sense, uh, uh, it's precisely the case that I do begin with Arab untranslatabilities. And because for the first time in the institute where I am, I have 20 to 25 or sometimes 15 students from all over, all over the Arab world, also Georgian and British, so not just Arab, uh, but the idea is to work with the different languages, uh, it's not ethnicity, but also these Arab students are meeting each other for the first time, 
and very often within the same national space, students from Morocco, for example, uh, meeting each other for the first time. There are untranslatabilities within national boundaries, and that's precisely what we begin with, by unpacking the national paradigm and by rethinking uh, periodicities behind Arab literary thought and the hegemons of certain genre. Uh, so that's very important. And I go, in order to rework that, as I said, uh, we work with, we go to Tamazight or we go to Yoruba in Nigeria. We have Nigerian students as well working between Arabic and Yoruba, uh, Arabic and Malay as well. So all the way to Georgian. And uh, so it is really a way to unpack the local to theorize the local and in doing so uh, offer this as uh, an intervention within the discipline at large. Uh, and for me, it, it, one has to work with difference uh, and to think in differentials, not just work with difference. Um, and that's very important, what it means to think, to think in differentials and begin from there without any uh, priority as to which position. And it's experimental. I draw on what's there. And that's rule number one. Uh, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ayman. If you talk, please. Yeah, I agree completely. I think uh, untranslatability is an education. It is something that we understand, something that we learn from comparative literature. And, I completely agree with Marie Therese that plurality actually, I won't say it shelters or thrives on untranslatability, it tries to engage with and negotiate. Also while thinking that it is, I mean, untranslatability is a condition. It is difference that we are looking at. Alterity cannot be collapsed into identity, I think. So that, that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Um, Nazri? Yeah, so I'll go with the first question of uh, indigeneity and nativism. And I think the point that I want to raise here is that uh, comparative literature, or uh, sorry, decolonization, uh, the way as, as the way I see it, it's not meant to, you know, to go to try, to, to to go for nativist uh, tendencies, right? Uh, but uh, this is okay for me saying it as a scholar. But certainly, I know that the political situations sometimes change in Malaysia. For instance, there is a need to recognize the Arabic influence of the Malay world, but not the pre-Arabic influence in, in, the, in the sense of the Indian influence of the Malay world. And so there has been a, a kind of politicization based on the racial politics of the day. But certainly in my own practice, and I hope uh, together with others as well, and certainly from the book that I mentioned, Farid Alatas and Benita Sina, the point is, was not to try to just replace one hegemony with another, but to expand the field against the notion of uh, certain, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, dominance, right? the dominance of uh, man and the dominance also of western centric kind of scholarship so uh, that's what i would say to the uh, so so uh, and relatedly with regards to indigenous studies and this is really important because southeast asia has also got its own uh, pockets of indigenous cultures and i think uh, a, a kind of comparative indigenous study is really important looking at you know be between the cultures of southeast asia's indigenous people as opposed to uh, the indigenous people in say uh, the pacific uh, northwest uh, of, of uh, you know north american stuff uh, so uh, then um, I'll, I'll move on to the next question, in, which is that question, the question of curriculum design, decolonization, and Iketan's question. And Iketan is right in that I'm pointing out the works of scholars that who are based in North America studying Southeast Asia. So there is already a certain distance in that sense. But within Southeast Asia itself, there are, there are scholars trying to study each other. But what they do is because they are also limited by uh, national, uh, I, I guess, languages and policies. The the way they study uh, comparative literature uh, from 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 my observation is to center where they are from. So they situate themselves. So Tula Longkorn University, when they talk about studying Southeast Asian literature, really look at Thai literature as the center, and then everything else trying to fit in. Uh, so it, they may not even study the entirety of Southeast Asia, but Thai literature in relation to something that they they know. And the same with uh, you know the Malay world uh, uh, in Brunei, there is a, a a conference as well. I'm sorry, a module that does that. So uh, and certain 
certainly in Singapore itself, the lack of decolonized uh, curriculum does contribute to uh, the the you know um, kind of the lack of uh, atten the, the lack of attention paid to comparative literature. But I also think uh, the point is very pragmatic in that comparative literature graduates uh, in Singapore at least cannot be seen as you know, going out into the job market and, you know, getting a job. And I think like in Asian societies, as, uh, I'm, and I'm too generalizing here, but certainly there is this focus increasingly about the, the, the value of the degree and a comparative literature degree uh, has already very little value, I think. And yeah, so that, that would be my answer. Well, with that uh, a bit uh, depressing note, and yet uh, just as uh, comparative literature as an institutional formation has been suffering around the world, uh, comparative literature as an intellectual formation has been thriving. And this is the paradox of comparative literature. Uh, for instance, our conference this year uh, has a participation participant number of 3,000 people, uh, which is almost unprecedented and from all over the world as in, uh, as in our uh, seminar today, uh, which is especially uh, international or transnational. Uh, so um, I think that's another question to ponder about the paradox of comparative literature as an intellectual formation versus as an institutional formation uh, for another day. Uh, but uh, I think we will close today's discussion and I'm sure you know, many of these discussions will continue after the seminar. Uh, but tomorrow we have a very, very uh, uh, strong, prominent uh, speakers uh, who will be uh, 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 speaking tomorrow morning at the same time for day three of our seminar, Geopolitics of Comparison Around the World. Um, thank you so much for uh, being here and see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.